All set? We're all set. Good evening. I'd like to call the Thursday, June 6th, regularly scheduled Berlin Select Board meeting to order. To my far left is Justin Lawrence, Flo Smith. To my right is Jeremy Hansen. I'm Brad Town, and with us also is uh, Dana Hadley, Town Administrator. Uh, any additions or changes to the agenda, Dana? I have a couple of additions. Um, we received today uh, an application for work in the right-of-way that I'd like to add to the agenda. I would like to add um, discussion and possible appointment of a few committee members. And I would like to delete the treasurer's report as she is on vacation. Okay. Uh, public comment? Hearing none. Um, we'll skip to the hazard mitigation update. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so a few things. Um, one for match, uh, you were interested in getting some match dollars, so there should be a sign-in for this, and you can utilize this meeting for that. Uh, there's a sign-in back there, I think. So mm -hmm. um, second to that, for the minutes, I'd like there to be, I did send out a query to the planning team members. I can read them off quickly. I can send you the list. I think I have. Nobody said no. So our planning team had said I'd like the minutes to reflect a, a formal approval of that. Mm -hmm. um, so your zoning administrator, Tom, uh, Rosemary, Corinne, um, uh, Chief Wolf, Tim, Tom Badowski. Well, he's a zoning. Yeah. Um, fire chief. Um, and uh, we have an airport representative and a hospital representative. And I will always send you their names. And right. the school representative I contacted, her email was bouncing back, and I left her a voicemail, so I have not heard back. Um, so that one's kind of in limbo at this point, but I can send you an updated list for the minutes. Okay, so okay. you'd like the board to do a motion to accept the... the... The planning team was approved, yes. Okay. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. And then... Uh, for the updated hazards. So in 2011, uh, it was really done in a rush following Irene, and the hazards were, and we can pass this out, I can read them off, but oh, I'm sorry. that's okay. Um, flash, obviously all things related to flooding, winter storm, ice, including ice storm, high winds, hurricane, severe storms. Sorry, wait till you get them. Charles keep eating me. Uh, earthquake, forest, and wildfire. And so for this plan, FEMA requires that those be looked at again, and if, any, if there's any inclusion or addition, then that gets formally mentioned as well. And, and based on what's happened since 2011 and the state hazard mitigation planning changes and recommendations, um, I propose that you keep the bolded in and remove the non-bolded. And really the thought is, what is the frequencies of these events of in impacting the town? And then second to that, what could the town do to actually mitigate those natural hazards? Earthquake obviously, very unlikely, and so are the, the mitigation measures would be very difficult to do that. So um, there is one addition that I have been adding since 2014, and that's extreme cold. Um, based on some climate change data, uh, the, the cold snaps are increasing for the region, and they bring about not only some financial risk, but some risk to, to um, health and safety as well. And for the 2000 update in the state plan, they, they rate regional risks for these, and the updated hazards are in line with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, 
Question? Paul, for my benefit, sure. if you could just explain, I think I know, but I okay. want to make sure I'm thinking the right way, of what the process is as far as the planning team, mm -hmm. how it connects with you, gotcha. how it connects with our new plan, mm -hmm. how do we get it approved, that those steps is what I'd okay. kind of like to know. So FEMA requires very elaborate explaining of how the planning process took place in this update. In 2011, you had the town administrator and one representative from CBRPC, which is unheard of now. You can't get away with that. So um, I like to include essentially the same swath of people. You have a hospital, you have an airport, so that's a little different than most towns. Um, but FEMA likes to see a, a pretty rounded portrait of community input. Um, the surveys, I can mention that too. So the planning team is now going to be included on correspondences. They will have updates. Those updates should be mentioned at each coming select board meeting and then captured in the minutes what those updates are. And then the planning team will always have the opportunity to review and comment and add at will. Once the plan is completed and the planning team has had an opportunity to review and comment, um, then there will be a submission to the state. The state submission, they will review it and they usually will return it to me with, a, with what FEMA calls a review tool. So FEMA has all these check boxes that have to be met. The state reviews for those check boxes being met and they normally kick it back and a few edits have to occur. Um, once those edits happen, I send it back to the state. They say, okay, it's good for send off. They send it to FEMA. FEMA reviews. FEMA will either approve or kick back for additional edits. Um, and that's all done through the state, uh, you know, as a liaison. Mm -hmm. And then it gets resubmitted, or maybe not. Whenever FEMA says, okay, it comes back pending adoption. So they will, they will approve it pending local adoption. So once that stems happen, there's a final meeting to approve your mitigation plan. Um, you'll have a cover sheet on the draft that, you know, normal attestation of that the town adopts this. Then it goes back to FEMA, it's really sealed, and then you're good for five years. So time period, um, from the time it's submitted to the state, to FEMA approval can take up to a year. Mm -hmm. uh, VEM can kick it back within a month, sometimes two months, just depending. Um, and then FEMA can have that for, you know, I've seen them have it for six months. So now we're at eight months, and if there's additional edits, and usually there is, you know, minor. Sure. Um, then, you know, that can kick into, you know, from, from project duration, it's usually about a year. So we started a month and a half ago. Um, so we're looking at probably best case next May for approval. Okay. Okay. That sound right. good? As you know, we, uh, our plan expired well, about a year ago, actually. Yeah. Um, I think it was the 18th of May um, that it expired last year. Right. And we've been working with the state on the grant. Okay. Um, which took some time. Yes, um, I know. So. so time is of the essence. We want to get that in as soon as possible because if something, if there should be a major disaster and you need public assistance, we have to have an approval. So, um, so I realize that. Right, and I realize this, if, if we did have a disaster, there's a mechanism maybe we could Absolutely. we could go to get around that problem. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, a lot of, I just want to mention some of the information that I'm going to need moving forward. Wait, or just no, going? you're fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, I talked to um, Tim and I met, or were corresponding before the meeting started. There's been five declared disasters since 2011 for Washington County, and that's number two. And then you see the dollars obligated to the county. So some of these were substantial. Four million, six million, three, one, or almost two rather, uh, and six. But Tim says no, P, no public assistance was a, was received in the town since 2011. Okay. Sounds right. Yes. Okay. That was just a FEMA from my FEMA money from Irene. Right? Yeah. yeah. No. So that's right. So any declared disaster uh -huh. post Irene 
Berlin was not damaged. Right. Okay. So, good. Yeah. That says a lot for the work that was done in 2011. Mm -hmm. So, successful mitigation. Yeah. Um, has there been any <coughs> residential property loss since 2011 that you're aware of? From a natural disaster? From flooding. Flooding. Well, I'm sure there was some damage caused by flooding, but nothing that was that we collected or reported. Okay. So not of significance, I guess. Not of significance. So you don't have residents coming to the town saying, what can I do? Um, because there, there's the buyout opportunity. Okay. No. All right. Great. Um, if there's time, I would like, if we could, just to run through the second and third page quickly. Yeah. Um, and if we have to follow up at a later time, that, that's fine. So in 2011, part of and what we're going to have to do for this plan is to name the mitigation actions. What the town plans to do for mitigation in the next five year planning cycle. So in this, this chart is what the 2011 plan stated you would do. And part of, the, part of the requirements for the update is to provide a status on these action items. And if no action has been taken, that's fine. I just have to say that. So um, was, and if we could go down the list, and if sure. we know, great. Um, was the property on Muzzy Road purchased? Yes. And yes. converted into a park. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, I have a suspicion about the second one, but uh, review and adapt building codes so that new structures are earthquake resistant. No action. No action. No action. That's fine. Um, install mobile home tie downs. In, in, uh, they have done elevation changes. Raised up, and I know. think I think they they put pads down for the oil tanks, didn't they? They did. Yeah. And who, um, the name of that park is? Uh, there's a couple, but it's... Um, Weston's. 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 What's the worst one? When in, I worked with UVM on a mobile home resiliency plan, and um, so there was, I, I remember Berlin being pretty high on the risk list. Right. River um, Run was another one. River Run, a, yes. A lot of problems. Okay. Yes, they yeah. So with that, then I, then I would move to add... Um, mm -hmm another action item or a, a mitigation measure is to include mobile home resilience. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of resources to do that. And it looks like they've done a lot already. Um, who could give me a narrative on all that's been Tom. done? Tom. He would okay. be very knowledgeable about that. Right. Um, West Hill Carverts was done. Yeah. Uh, any any in I mean, I know the town's not going to go out and provide training, but was any information from any agency or community partner given to residents on, on these issues? The Energy Committee um, was active with that and okay. had um, materials here that people could borrow, such as the caulking gun. And, and Efficiency Vermont also makes that, that material available, too. Okay. And residents were notified that that opportunity was available yes. through the town. Okay. Um, any electrical systems upgrade to building shelters? Um, we put a generator in uh, for here. Right. Since 2011. When did that generator go in? It was here when I came. Okay. In 2012. The school um, had a bunch of a bunch of renovations. Um, do you know if they changed the electrical system at all? Or if they changed the generator and all sorts of things. Or if they redid the electric. I mean, they, they gutted the whole inside. They would have redone a lot of that recently. Since 2011? Yeah, it was, what, three years ago? Yeah. Okay. And I can just reach out to the facility person at the school and just get a synopsis. Mm -hmm. um, Any NFIP issues that you're aware of? No, NFIP is a National Flood Insurance Program. Yes. Yeah, we, yeah, we did qualify yeah. for that. What, what level was that? For the um, I'm embarrassed to say I can't think okay. right now, but Tom is very knowledgeable about that and was instrumental in getting that um, okay. no so problem. that many people could made it necess uh, not necessary for them to have flood insurance. Mm -hmm. um, I think. Is the community racist? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dan. 
Thank you. CRS means something else to me. And that's where I am. <laughs> uh, I, I'll check with Tom on the second one, too. Right. Um, and again, I think that's Tom question, that third one on the NFIP. That, yeah, that definitely happened. That's oh. yeah, but I don't remember where, where they are anymore, but okay. those were definitely available. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I did the the 2011 plan does have a comprehensive that has the Dog River corridor plan in it, so that's some, oh, we're not going to do that tonight. There's a lot of projects, mm -hmm. so yeah. I will need, you know, moving forward, just need an update on some of those projects identified. And I can work with Tim. And sure. Okay. Um, any alternative water supplies or dry hyd hydrants in the south part of town? I can check with fire. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have the city water system now since 2011. Okay. And that's not in the south part of town, though. Okay. Yeah. Feed toward Riverton. Oh, yeah. okay. that more there. Yeah. Um, but the fire department does have several dry hydrants. Okay. I can check with the chief. Uh, any wildfire pamphlets distributed that anybody remembers? That'd be, that'd be fire chief, too. Or okay, the, yeah. Or the fire department president. Yeah. They, they don't. Okay, that's... Uh, that's it. I can follow up on the rest of those. Thank you. Okay. So, if there's no questions, uh, moving forward, there's just going to be period. I'm going to keep updating the, the planning team, and I'll communicate with you for updates at the subsequent select board meetings mm -hmm. um, to be captured in the minutes. There is a community survey that's going to be made available. Yes. And um, Rosemary has it to give out now, and we're going to send it with the tax bills. Should we ever send a tax bill again after the school bond gets done? But <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> All right. we will. What was the motion you needed? Uh, just to approve the planning team. Okay. Okay. To approve the planning team as presented. I second the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Yeah. I appreciate it. And I hope you all have a great night. Okay. We appreciate you. Why not? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. 802. Mm hmm. 498. Okay. 8435. Thank you. I'm not over there. No, it's okay. Thank you. Approval of licenses, permits, vouchers, and applications. Move to approve general fund accounts payable warrant number 19G24 with checks 19136 through 19160 in the amount of $118,299.43. Also, payroll warrant number 19 24 for payroll from May 12th, 2019 through May 25th, 2019 in the amount of $41,424.46. Second motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Berlin Center Cemetery Trustees. Is there anyone here from the cemetery? No. Terrible question. <laughs> Okay, the trams. We're here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding exit seven park and ride. We have some boards that we'd like to sit up. Where's the where's the good spot where we don't walk folks? Probably in this right area in and I'll get out of your way. So while well, they're doing that, I guess I'm Scott Burbank with V Trans and then we have Tina Bull, who's the project manager of Berlin. And then over here we have Derek. I just drew a complete blank on your name. Derek Henderson, who's the project supervisor. Um, so I don't know if you were here, Flo. It's been almost a year, more than a year. We came here and we presented on the Berlin Exit 7 Park and Ride. And at the time, Mr. Clark, who we've talked to since then, had some concerns. Uh, we have since addressed those concerns using berms. Probably standing right in the camera. Um, and so basically, we just wanted to come back. We've met with Mr. Clark May, early May? April. April, a long time ago. Yes, yeah, time flies. Anyways, we met Mr. Clark, and you know he's not obviously a, a proponent or a fan of the uh, project, but he was very satisfied with what we've done. So we just want to come back to you because you're 
direction was to work with him and. Um, I did tell him about this meeting and told him it was going to be about seven thirty, but um, I don't know what that message on the machine. So you want me to hold it? I don't know. He plans on coming or not, but I did notify him. But he knows the plan. But yeah, we met with him. We're here after we met with him. He is well aware. So I guess this is more of just a follow up, just so you're aware of what's going on, talking about what we did, the changes. And then um, after this, we're currently working on preliminary plans and when is construction? 20, uh, 20, 20, 20, 2021? The clearing would be 20, probably 20, winter 2021, I think. Yeah, so it's a little ways out. We're in the beginning stages. We have to get all our permits. So. Right. So anyways, Daniel. Yeah. So last time um, we had spoke, there were, we had a whole bunch of different alternatives that we had developed and through that process, we ultimately came to this alternative here, which was the preferred alternative in both our original design and through discussion with VTrans and you folks and Mr. Clark, we all, oh, great. Um, we were able to get to this, this design alternative um, here that you're, that you're looking at this plan. And one of the one of the things that we wanted to make sure was that we provided as much screening as we could to this private residence here, which is Mr. Clark's home. And so we, as you can see here, we pr proposed landscaping all throughout this area here. And um, there's contour lines shown here. I don't know if you can see, but um, essentially what we tried to do to as within the limits of the area that we actually had to work with was lower the parking lot as much as possible and then raise the landscaping around the parking lot, which in combination would provide as much screening as possible through elevation change. And so we took the existing parking lot, which you can see outlined here, and we've, we've expanded it towards Route 62 and in this direction here. We've, uh, but what we've done by doing that is we've actually taken the grades and we've lowered this entire portion of the parking lot. To the, to the maximum extent possible while still being able to get this water to drain out into where it used to drain with the existing facility so that we wouldn't have to create a new, new outfalls. And so we did that and then here what you can see in this red line is the, is the property line that we had to work with. We didn't want to go beyond that property line. And so we took that remaining space that we had available and we created a, a small berm um, here, the berm ends up being about two feet higher than the edge of the parking lot. And then it slopes back down to meet the existing grade at the fence, which is on the property line. So we couldn't make that berm any higher than two feet because then we wouldn't be able to grade it back down to meet the existing ground mm -hmm. while still staying in the state property. And so that's, um, that's what we did there. And then here what we did is because of all of this excavation that we're doing to lower the parking lot, we were able to take that excess material and place it here and actually raise this area as well. Um, this area is gonna be raised around eight feet, six to eight feet. And we're putting trees in front of it here. Um, and this doesn't necessarily screen the parking lot, but it will help to screen him from Route 62, which is, a, you know, we felt would be at least an added benefit um, as well. And so between the, and then you can see here as well as the, you know, the bus shelter, the bike rack, the accessible parking here. Uh, this is the bus turnaround. We do still show the improvements we will be making here at this intersection as well. So one of the things that we're doing is we're providing a do not block intersection, striping along with signage to help encourage people not to stop directly in that intersection to help people that are trying to enter here and leave. And we've also actually widened this intersection here in order to provide a right turn lane so that any vehicles that are turning left can stay in this lane and allow vehicles that are headed towards the highway to still be able to go around, the, you know, to bypass this one lane as it is today, to give them that ability to be able to turn right and continue um, down 62 towards the highway. And finally, you can see here, we do have this exit out of, the, out of the park and ride directly onto 62, which we felt would further lower the amount of vehicles that are going to this intersection, which um, to kind of reduce the congestion that would be there. 
Uh, one of the things that we developed in order to show the screening, um, obviously this is a little bit difficult to visualize if you're just seeing it on the plan. And so what we did is we developed um, some perspectives. Uh, this perspective here is basically standing at the existing facility right where that existing bus shelter is, looking towards Mr. Clark's house. Uh, his house, as you can see, there's the roof line right there of his home in that image. And then what we've done is we've overlaid our proposed park and ride over that same exact image. And so you can see here, that is his roof line again there. And here you can see this is that berm that I was talking about over um, on the side. And this is the small berm that we're able to provide here along with the evergreen trees that we would be planting here and here to, per, to kind of screen this portion of the parking lot from his home. You can see the lighting we're proposing is all cutoff lighting so that the light does not go beyond the parking lot. It kind of gets shot straight down into the pavement instead of out. And so to kind of reduce the light pollution that would potentially be happening. <clears throat> and um, you can see this is, this is where that exit out of the facility onto 62 would be right right around in this area here uh, but you can see that in this perspective you can see the parking lot does increase in length you know so you got the existing pavement here um, but here it does go a little much further to increase the size of the parking lot facility um, in this other perspective so this perspective is taken from 62 looking so one of the things that we we um, in order to create this on in time we did have to take some photos during the winter so that did make it tough but the the benefit of taking the photos in the winter is you don't see any of the summer foliage and so this is kind of the worst case scenario right so if, if it's vegetated and screened in the winter in the summer it only gets better when the deciduous trees have their leaves and so this image even though um, this looks green it's actually we just digi digitally edited the snow out of the image so this is what you would see um, under the worst case scenario but in the summer you this would be even fuller and you're, this is standing on 62 so it's standing um, standing here looking uh, in this direction and thank you you can see this is the limit of the park the park and ride here this is where that bus turnaround is and there at the far end over there is the proposed bus shelter and mr clark's home is is here you can see his roof line here and you can see it again in this image here down below at that point um if you have any questions um or concerns so I'd be happy to answer them I was going to say, is the top pitcher a month ago? <laughs> yeah, close to it. Um, close to it, probably. But for um, February, February, additional spaces did you add? Um, the existing facility, um, just to go back to this, the existing facility had 76 spaces, and the proposed facility has 112. That includes the accessible, uh, the five accessible parking spaces. 112. 112. Yes. Uh, there's also a bus shelter, accommodations for bicycles, and uh, it's, it's, there's new lighting proposed throughout. Um, currently, the, the lighting is not cut off lighting, mm -hmm. so the lighting situation would actually be improved over what is out there today. Mm -hmm. We are proposing some, um, some swales um, to help with the runoff um, to you know, provide additional sedi sedimentation to kind of settle out of the water before it enters into the closed drainage and, and things like that to help with some of that environmental impact uh, beyond what the existing facility has. Mm -hmm. Other than the elevation, is the entrance different? The entrance to the facility is actually, even, even elevation-wise, because we're tying into an existing road there, we're, it's basically matching existing. It's, it's mm -hmm. pretty much the same as, as it is under current conditions. It will be repaved with new pavement, but sure. beyond that, it's yeah. about the same. Um, the new exit onto 62. Yes. Is that going to take? Uh, have you taken into account enough swing room for cars to get around the corner? Yeah. So we've we've run turning movements, and there's actually enough movements there for a bus. 
um, for a bus to be able to exit out of that exit. Uh, as you can see, it, the, the radius here is much larger on this side than it is here on this side. And, and it, it kind of has the same effect as like a slip ramp where it guides you in the direction you're headed. And so we did check the turning movements here to make sure that a bus would be able to exit the facility after. So if they dropped off and picked up here, they would then cut through the center and then exit onto 62 this way. I believe it's going to be stop condition. So it is a stop. It's not a slip ramp. It's a drive. Yeah, it's a driveway, but it is an angled driveway. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah. Um, yes. yeah. I'm just saying that you get uh, angles to your parking spots. I was wondering if you're going to have uh, cars coming around the upper end of it to mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Clark's house. If they came back around, they'd be able to use it. Um, so vehicles, vehicles that wanted to use this exit after going this way would, would, would have to circle around an exit. Um, the reason for the angled parking primarily is due to the limited space we have. And so if we use perpendicular parking, we wouldn't have enough width in the aisles. Um, and so that's the primary reason for the angle parking. We did also make sure that all of the angle parking, um, any vehicles parking in that area would have their headlights shining away from his home, not angled towards his home. And so that was the reason for the direction of the angle parking nice. that you see. No left turn. Oh, uh, yeah. yes, no left turn <laughs> uh, on that's 62. Correct. <laughs> I mean, you can try, but... Uh, it would be difficult, and that's another reason why we angle that driveway, to make it even more difficult for someone to try to attempt to go left. It, you know, naturally you are angled into the correct direction of travel. The, the entrance directly onto 62 seems unusual to me. Are there any rules about that? or it's, um, um, From a traffic perspective and from a safety perspective, we did evaluate that to make sure that there would be enough space and uh, ability for vehicles to enter um, and it would be safe for them to do so. And we, so we did evaluate that uh, based on the volumes that we would be generating by the facility. Uh, being close to the existing signal intersection, um, the exiting vehicles would, would basically um, have those times when the traffic signal would slow, the, would slow the vehicles coming straight through. That would be their opportunity to exit the facility. Um, but it, and it is a stopped condition, so we are uh, requiring the vehicles to come to a complete stop. Uh, it's not a yield condition where they can just go and accelerate right onto 62. They do need to come to a complete stop. So the idea being there's not that much actual traffic doing that per day and yeah. it's so close to the intersection that it's right. the equivalent of a right on red at the intersection. Correct, correct. And we're not generating um, per hour. Vehicles being generated at the facility are, is a small enough number that we're not really contributing a lot of traffic to 62 um, in that area. Um, I've had a lot of experience living there mm -hmm. um, all my life, 55 years. The, the existing parking lot, I believe, went in in 81. And it was a it was a perfect situation, you know, for visibility that's close to the intersection. All the things that make it have made it a really great parking lot are are also the reasons that I feel um, it's that are that are against it from a safety standpoint and a traffic flow standpoint. Um, there's clearly a real need for a commuter parking lot in the immediate area. But I feel like the entrance onto 62, um, just intuitively, it seems a little sketchy to me. I, I get that it's the equivalent of the right on red. How, how far is it from there to the intersection, from the, the access of the, the exit of the um, parking I, lot? From the I don't remember for sure off the top of my head, but I would estimate it's about 300 feet or so, three to 400 so feet. So 100 yards, roughly. Mm -hmm. I, I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense when there's traffic is stopped there. That makes perfect sense. Um, but uh, people going through the green light are cooking along at pretty like pretty much like 50. I, I had my own vehicle totaled by a Burlington police officer running a red light about approximately 20 years ago. My daughter approximately a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, the same thing, a person running the red light in the wrong totaled her car with my infant granddaughter in there. She also, about two years before that, 
further down 62 at the hospital intersection had the same thing and her car was totaled by somebody running a red light. So I just hope everybody in power here to have any influence over the decision making process really consider seriously just that 62 is a really dangerous stretch. And to me, some of this would be helped by, I think all the designers have done um, contortions to try to make this better for me, and I acknowledge that and I appreciate it um, within having the lot there. But in my mind, designing towards the future, it would be much better to have it across from the, uh, the new visitor center where there's bathrooms for people when they get back to their car after a long ride, there's refreshments, there's still the same visibility and I don't think the state at the higher up level ever really considered any other spot than that. And I just don't think it's good planning for the future when we have the library site, we have the site across from the, the visitor center that I think would be all nearly as accessible and quick off the highway and would be a little safer for an approach for exit and, and entrance. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Comments on our awesome green? Bob, any questions? No, I apologize for getting here late. I actually believe the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> you should never do that, Bob. I know. <laughs> okay. me in my part. But I, no, I've seen it tonight before, just so yeah, just I, was in, I was introducing the. Um, yeah, yeah. We had an appointment. I, I agree with, with Bob. I, I, you know, uh, it would be nice if we were somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, I understand the state's position. We have vested this property already. But um, I do think as we go forward, and I would encourage the state to consider. Stop considering these narrow strips of right of way next to the highway as the right way place, way place to go. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah. yeah. When you when you come off that uh, exit onto 62, <clears throat> you would turn. You stop, and then you turn right into the the second of the two lanes right there. The closer to the right. Lane, yes. But there's no there's no slipstream lane that you could come into and then you could gradually enter into that yeah. lane? Uh, there is not, um, particularly for the reason to encourage vehicles to actually stop. Um, if you provide them a, a lane to go into, right. then they typically will not decelerate and will try to go right into 62 without slowing down. And so the idea is to encourage them to stop because they have to go into a travel lane that's mm -hmm. already there. Because the fact that you have a 10 foot shoulder there yeah. provides them with a slope lane. Yeah, people use the shoulder, right? But it w would not be signed as, as such, and it would, you know, we wouldn't make that formal. And the same thing's true with the intersection. It's a right on red turn. You don't, again, not a, you don't have any kind of a. That, r that right is a protected right. It's, um, all, it's all controlled by the traffic signal. So they will have a protected right turn, so they will have a time when they can make that right turn where there aren't no, there aren't opposing vehicles coming. I see. They do it all the time now. Yeah, yeah the, the for roads several widen. years. Yeah, the road's wide enough there that they. Yeah, they go onto the grass and kind of go in the well, shoulder don't even a have little to bit. Do that. If they just drop off over to the yellow yeah. line on the on yeah. the pain turnpike, there's plenty of room for them to go yeah. around you. Yeah. This will help formalize that uh, that maneuver. Yes. Question. Yeah. So, are you proposing improving the the signals? At the intersection? Uh, the sig yep, the signal timings will be updated and, um, new, signal and new signal heads and, right. and yeah, all of those. Allow that time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. And they'll be relocated to align with the new lanes and, and so the signal heads will be shifted to their Great. proper locations. Okay. Yes. Good. Yep. New cabinet <laughs> and all of that. Any other questions? When is this supposed to take place? <laughs> so we're just starting preliminary plans. We're in 2019. 
we could be, I don't know, there's a lot of trees to clear, but we could do clearing in this winter of 2020, but most likely it'd be tough to get the plans out to bid for the 2020 construction season. I don't, I don't believe we will. Either. Yeah, I don't believe we will either. So I would assume it'd be the summer of 2021. At the earliest. At the earliest. Assuming we can get all the permits that we need. <clears throat> we have enough of work going out in 2020. We would not put this one out and try to build it in 2020. There's a number of other projects going on. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Well, thank you for letting us come and talk to you this evening. This is Jamie, Hello. who's with my colleague at uh, Central Mountain Corrections Coalition. We've been here before, but it's been a while, um, so we thought it was a good time to check in uh, and talk to you about um, the town's role in substance misuse prevention and other healthy ways of uh, making the town a better place to live. Um, so I'm going to pass around a bunch of different things and talk about a few of them. This is just I'll put it this way: um, who we are and what we do and how you can reach us. And uh, one thing I'm going to give you right off the top because it's new, hot off the presses, and rather exciting is an ordinance from St. Johnsbury, who just declared their downtown public buildings tobacco-free all the buildings and a 25-foot perimeter. So we, we're watching pretty closely what's going on with ordinances having to do with tobacco um, because it's, it's taking off. You know, we've been working on this for 20-some years, and it's starting to take off. Um, Montpelier made its parks smoke-free about eight years ago. Um, Barry had smoke-free parks, but with our assistance, they made bigger perimeters because some of the parks in Barry um, are pretty tiny, and if you're out of the park and on the sidewalk, the smoke is still going into the park. So um, we did a little bit of work with them, and they put a 25-foot perimeter around all the parks and threw in a couple extra parks, too, while they were at it. And they put in a, an ordinance that allows certain public events to be declared if, if the organizer of the event, and mostly it's, it's the um, Downtown Barry Association, they um, can make an event tobacco-free. So the, the uh, Fourth of July parade, that sort of thing, has been done in a tobacco-free way. It's, um, it's a work in progress. You know, we've, we've had tables down there, and um, we have to keep reminding. It's all posted, and there's a designated smoking area, but we have to keep reminding people that this is a tobacco-free event. There's a lot of children here. The secondhand smoke is a, a great danger to um, public health. So um, it's a work in progress. We have to politely talk to a lot of people at an event like that. And one of the things um, that we've been giving out to towns for the last several years is a document that just says, here's what towns can do. It's, it's fairly generic, um, but there are a lot of things that towns can do in order to make the town a healthier place. East Montpelier, Last year, when they did their, redid their town plan, they actually included a section on health for the first time ever. Um, and it's, it's a fairly small section at this point, but at least it, it puts the value into the town plan that we, we want to make sure that we have access to fresh food. We want to make sure that we have um, access to physical activity opportunities and that sort of thing. Barry has a section in their town plan as well. Um, so we just want to plant that seed that this is, you know, there's a lot of other things and other values that get expressed in ordinances and plans, but 
public health isn't always there. Um, and we think it should be. So this one, uh, we've got sections on alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, and opiates. Um, just what can you think about when you're looking at your town and these particular substances? Because those are the big ones. Um, a couple years ago, I did come up here and, and talk about um, the vulnerability of towns to the marijuana industry. And um, most towns have nothing in statute or anywhere else to protect themselves from um, somebody just deciding that they wanted to get a permit to put a marijuana grow house on an empty lot. Um, if it's not in your zoning or if it's not in an ordinance, the law did not pass this year. Um, you probably know that. But the law that was up for grabs was an opt, help me with this one. Opt in versus opt, opt out. In. So you were, you're automatically in unless you take an affirmative vote of the town to mm -hmm. opt out mm -hmm. of both retail and uh, grow houses. So it's something to think about before you get a surprise of somebody who's um, decided that they want to put some sort of a marijuana related facility in your town and you didn't see it coming. Um, you've, you've been warned. Uh, Middlesex last summer did put, uh, give permission for a grow house right off of exit, what is that exit? Eight, nine. 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 Yeah. Um, hasn't been put in place yet, but they did approve it. Um, but they did put some conditions in because we went and talked to them about risks that they were unaware of in terms of the energy use and uh, water pollution and a whole bunch of other risks that we've heard from other states that have, and from our own experience with the um, dispensary system. Um, this particular growing group is uh, organic farmers, um, but what we hear from Colorado and Oregon and Washington is that they, they can be a lot of pollution. A lot of herbicides and pesticides and things are used in these facilities, and they do use a boatload of electricity. So something to think about, be forewarned. Um, I have a quick question about the uh, St. J uh, ordinance. Yep. Did they have to have a do a charter change to allow them to pass this ordinance? I don't know. Okay. We, we heard about it through the grapevine, and then I asked them for just a copy of the ordinance, and that was what they sent me. Okay. So I don't know if a charter change, okay. I don't know under what circumstances a charter change is needed for. Well, I mean, if, if, if statute says the town's going to regulate such things, and the town's going to regulate such things, if it doesn't, then you have to go through a charter change to enable that. Yeah. So I, I don't know if they did that. I think this was just a straight, just straight out ordinance, yeah. but I can ask them. So sort of in line with the document I just gave you, we've, we've been working on this one, which is um, a, a town-specific way to sort of frame some of the conceptual ideas that are in that first document. Um, so for that one, I looked through um, some data sources. I looked through your, what was on your website. Um, the, the first part of that is here are things that a town can do to make it a healthier place. And then the, it goes into some data around, well, here's what Berlin is already doing. Um, and didn't find a lot of ordinances that were relevant. Um, but there are certain things, resources particularly on your website that point people in the direction of farmers markets and uh, other kinds of resources that help you. I have the most recent data I can find to let you know how you're doing with the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and um, from the Vermont Department of Health website to say how are we doing health-wise in, in this area. And, um, it's, it's not great. Um, you know, we have a lot of issues and a lot of health issues. We have relatively high tobacco use, and uh, that creates a lot of um, health issues. And our, our youth are, um, again, we have pretty high, well, Vermont in general, and I flagged where um, Washington County was higher than, or actually the, the U32 district was higher than the state, because we always look at that comparison. The tobacco among youth use has been like a roller coaster. It was just going down, 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 down because of all the work that was being done 
to stop advertising and uh, do some point of sale work and that sort of thing. And then the e-cigarettes hit uh, about three, four years ago. And uh, it's back up to 30%. It was down below 10 um, because those are marketed to appeal to young people. They come in bubble gum and hundreds of different flavors. And we talked to a lot of youth. Jamie's done a ton of um, presentations at schools and all around the county. They don't think there's nicotine in them, and there is a lot. Um, they don't think that they're harmful. They think that what's being inhaled is just water vapor. It's not. It's a, it's a chemical time bomb. Um, so it's something that we're really concerned about. And you probably heard that there was legislation passed this session to raise the age of purchase of tobacco to 21, which we've been working on for decades. So that's great because the research shows that if a, somebody hasn't started smoking by the time they're 21, they most likely never will. It's less than 1%. So if you can just put it off, um, you, you might have people who never smoke. And that's exactly why Big Tobacco has been fighting that so hard. Um, they also um, have put a tax on the e-cigarettes that's equivalent to that on alcohol and tobacco. And they've put some legislation in place that you can only sell these products if you're a licensed Vermont dealer. So they can't order them from Amazon anymore. Even if they get a gift card from Grandma, they can't do that. So three big wins on tobacco that we're pretty excited about and postponing on marijuana, which is great. Um, so this little handout, informative handout, is about Point of sale, we did an audit of every store in Washington County a year ago um, that sells tobacco or alcohol. And um, the results of that let us know that there are, we're doing actually quite well in, in terms of um, point of sale. We, we look for things like our, our cigarettes put near um, toys and candy and things that are attractive to kids are advertising uh, at, at a low level where it will be um, right in the kid's face when they are in a store. You know, how much advertising are they exposed to in a store or outside of a store? And um, so this is a little document that, that says why we think about point of sale. And this is something that's totally in the wheelhouse of a, of a town to um, look at and, and put some restrictions on. You, you can't restrict um, the content. You can't pass a law that says no tobacco advertising, because that violates the First Amendment. But you can put restrictions, and some, many times I've done this, on the amount of window space that can be covered by advertising. And in a lot of communities, they're doing this for two reasons. One is to cut down on the number of ads, particularly substance ads that kids are exposed to. But the other one is just a safety thing. You know, if, if you picture a typical convenience store and it, the, the windows are completely covered with ads, nobody can see in the building, law enforcement driving by, for instance, and the people in the building can't see out to the parking lot to see what's going on. So from a public safety point of view, uh, that's another reason to think about doing something around advertising. I've got one copy of this because I was just saving paper. But this came from the, um, the health department. Uh, just pass it around. It's just sort of a summary, a stat up status update of what's going on in the county from all the data sources that the health department has, which are many, many data sources. So um, Jamie was going to bring our butlers, because she, at the downtown uh, event that was yesterday, she had a table with mm -hmm. butlers. Mm -hmm. Butlers are these, um, her, her husband took the car with the butlers in yes. it, so she put on butlers to show you, and I'm show and tell. Yeah. But you've probably seen them in Montpelier. They're about this tall, and they're on street signs, and they've got a little hole in them, and they're decorated. They look like a little birdhouse, um, and it's where you can put a cigarette butt. Um, instead of putting it on the ground and either stepping on it or not. Um, the ones that go on the ground end up in the gutters and they end up in the Winooski River. There is no filtration <coughs> system for cigarette butts on the ground. So they go into the river and they kill the fish and the ducks. So um, we put these in. We now have, I think, 
15 or so of them. We started with just five, and we've been adding to them. Um, the, we have a partnership with Montpelier Alive and the Trash Tramps, who are the folks who go around uh, on Tuesdays and pick up litter. Um, my husband is one of them, and he specializes in picking up cigarette butts. He does use tongs, um, and they have to wear gloves. He gets hundreds on, in an hour on every Tuesday, because that's how many are, are on the ground. And then we get another many hundreds when we empty the butlers. And what happens to those butts that get picked up are they're recycled. They're sent to New Jersey, and they're recycled. They take out the compostable parts, the tobacco. They, and they compost those. But all of the fibrous parts and the filters, they recycle them and they become park benches and that sort of plastic recycle stuff. It's a company called TerraCycle. Um, Barry had, now has butlers too. Um, it's, it's a great public health statement to just encourage people to do something with their cigarette butts rather than just throw them on the ground. We've worked for several years with Montpelier to get them to think about um, making smoke-free downtown. Um, we haven't given up, but they haven't either. Um, but it's it's something that I think towns can think about. And when you're doing your new your new downtown um, planning, it's something to think about if you're going to have senior housing or something like that. How can you make a downtown or a part of a downtown? smoke-free. Um, St. Jay just did that. Um, it's pretty easy to get beyond what's town property or a 25-foot perimeter. Uh, I'm not sure what they're doing with sidewalks, uh, if, it's, if it's within the perimeter. Um, what we'd like to see is, is a smoke-free downtown where nobody has to breathe anybody else's smoke. Um, kids, people who are allergic. Um, and Recognizing that there are people who are addicted to tobacco, we would suggest that we have some kind of a designated smoking area so that people who need to smoke or feel that they need to smoke have somewhere to go, um, where there's somewhere to put their butts and um, they can be sheltered, because right now they often have to huddle um, around the back of a building because they can't smoke in the buildings, um, so they just go right outside. So we, we, we're trying to figure that one out, um, but we haven't done that yet. So, and the last thing I want to invite you to is um, we do community forums, and this one is coming up. It's going to be at Kellogg Hubbard Library. It's on uh, alcohol. Alcohol is still the number one substance of abuse in our culture. Um, we hear a lot more about opiates, but in terms of the number of people impacted, um, Alcohol is the big one. There's just something about cold northern towns. It just lends itself to wanting to drink. It's a big deal with kids uh, and youth use. Uh, we did this same presentation and, at the Aldrich Library a few weeks ago, and um, the head of the ER department up at CVMC is one of the presenters, uh, Dr. Mashkuri. And it, it was riveting what he had to say about what he's seeing at much younger ages in terms of liver impact um, than he saw 20 years ago. So um, feel free to put that on your website or invite the community members because it's Kellogg Hubbard Library. We, we all, I think, now belong to that, or maybe or not. Mm -hmm. Berlin or out, I don't know. Uh, so any, any questions or thoughts or comments on how to make a healthier Berlin in terms of substance misuse, which is what we call it now. It's not called abuse anymore. It's substance misuse, because substances can be used effectively or in a way that's harmful. Who's seen a butler? Have you noticed that you've seen them? Yeah. I think I have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah right there on the street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also just got back from, from Germany, where they're everywhere. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ours come from Portland, Maine. It's a guy who just hated seeing the butts on the ground, and so he invented this thing, and he's he's refining it constantly, so they're much better than they were five years ago. But Yeah, they, they have all sorts of like catchy slogans yeah. encouraging people to use them. Yeah. But Paris put in place a really significant fine if you drop a butt on the ground, like hundreds of dollars. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. We just stare at them. 
haven't seen the butlers yet, but I'll be looking for them. Yeah, yeah. they're all up and down um, Main Street and going down State Street. They don't go past the State House. Um, a lot of those buildings are protected because they're federal buildings or state buildings, so they already have a perimeter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we got, we've got them where we can. Um, what we did was we did a census to see where butts were congregating, and those are the places where we tried to put the butlers, um, because where people were already dropping a lot of cigarette butts, that, that was a hot spot. Um, some, some stores have their own little devices or whatever, buckets, various things outside. Um, but they complained, because we did a big major survey, they complained about having to sweep up so many butts every day when they come in in the morning. And we have had uh, complaints from store owners in the summer that if they have their doors open, particularly if they have fine clothing or any, anything, that the smoke is going to damage um, because it comes right in mm -hmm. to the facility. So a lot, of, a lot of stuff to do. Any ideas? Any suggestions? What should we work on next? What would you like to see us focusing on? I think it's a huge undertaking as it is right now. It There's is. just so much, and I commend you on everything you're doing already. Yep. We're, we're the ones who do the take-back days and the mailers so that if you can't get to a take-back day, we now have um, permanent drop boxes in every police department and mm -hmm. many pharmacies where you can just go and drop off your drugs rather than leaving them in your medicine cabinet for mm -hmm. whoever comes into your house to access. Mm -hmm. I've done that. I think it's a wonderful resource. It is. And uh, Barry's had a pilot program for Sharps that we're looking to see if we can get it out possibly to town clerks and other rural places so that you can get rid of um, needles in a safe way. Um, you, you can recycle them, but you have to duct tape them into a laundry detergent. But it's, it's, it's easier to just slip them into a sharps disposal thing um, and dispose of them safely. And it's not used, it's used somewhat by people who are abusing injectable substances. It's used mostly by people who have a medical reason. Um, and an incredible amount of it is people who have to shoot medicine into their pets. They don't know what to do with the needles. So, I um, noticed this is a fairly new ordinance in St. John's. Yeah, just passed. So it's mm -hmm. really too early to see what effect it's had. So that will mm -hmm. be interesting to see yeah. um, <coughs> what effect it has. Yeah, the coalitions mm -hmm. all communicate regularly. <coughs> so we're in regular touch with the St. John's mm -hmm. people. They started with parks, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is Barry City's um, fairly new as well? That's a couple years old. Really? Have they noticed any? improvements or any sort of statistics on that? Or? I don't think we have any statistics, but, just curious. but I'll ask yeah. Lucas what, what he's seeing. He mm -hmm. was really uh, an advocate, the, sure. the mayor there. Um, That'd be great. The, that uh, somewhere in one of the documents there's that 3450, which is, you know, three, um, yeah, three behaviors lead to four chronic illnesses that lead to more than 50% of deaths of Vermont. And I think it's over 60% now. Yeah. Uh, it's like so 58 just, when I looked at I think, yeah. 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 Um, so towns can earn, um, from the health department, they can earn scores uh, or medals, um, actually metals. You can be a bronze, silver, gold uh, town in terms of this public health initiative. and. Barry's already gold, and they want to know if we're going to make it platinum, if there's going to be a platinum ranking, and what would they have to do to get that? So they're, they're interested in uh, increasing the visibility of, of public health in their town. And given social media is so huge, are you using social media right now? And oh, really yeah. Yeah, yes. that. Absolutely. Yeah. And wonderful. a lot of this stuff, too, can be student-led, like True. students surveying where areas in the town have a lot of cigarette litter or, you know, like I know that St. J, they work with a lot of their OVX, our Voices Exposed, student-led group to help, you know, talk with administrators and talk with people and make stuff happen so they can tie it into school learning as well, which is my specialty and what I do mm -hmm. with the organization. Um, so it can be a multifaceted project. It was Spalding students who actually yeah. got the butlers yep. there. Mm -hmm. do, do you remember Allie Wolf? Did she work with you guys? 
because she was, she was doing some. She's a, a was a Berlin resident, U32 student, and I know she was doing a lot. That, mm -hmm. that, that name rings a bell. Yeah. 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 And I just uh, found Vermont statutes um, explicitly allow uh, towns to adopt municipal ordinances regarding yeah. smoking, so mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a church. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, good. I don't have to ask. Any other questions for this, Jenny? All right. Yep. Thank you for letting us Thank come. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you have our contact information if you think of another route that you think would be uh, worth our time. Thanks um, for all the materials, too. You bet. Maybe come to that. Put some out in the community. Come to that event. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Brad, perhaps you would put next the um, working in the right of way application which sure. is for Mr. Fitzhugh. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so working in the right of way, Josh? Yes, yeah, this is. Um, we have a farm access road off um, McCarty Road. McCarty Road is a, just a short road that has only one home on it right now. Um, the Wilcox, Dave, uh, Dave and Les Wilcox. But we use, there's a road that we use to access our, our uh, fields for hay. Uh, and there's a pretty sharp turn off McCarty Road to get on that. And so we, the suggestion is that we <coughs> increase the length of the culvert. There's a, um, the road foreman or something, they were looking at it last week. I think it's a 15 inch, existing 15 inch uh, culvert, steel culvert, <coughs> 20 feet long. And the suggestion was to increase that to 40 feet, two lengths of 20 feet each. Yep. I guess the, the town has some culvert, which I would buy from the town. And then we put it in and that's pretty all, it's just as simple. So, but it allows the turn to be a little easier. You don't have to worry quite as much about falling into the extension. Yeah, just an extension. Very little traffic on that road. And you have seen it, and you're mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Ruth just proved the permit for digging in the right of way as presented. And I second that motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fitz. I enjoyed the listening to the presentation on the on the uh, passageway. I don't get to go to, I don't come to very many select board meetings, so. Well, you're always welcome. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, thank, do you thank know you. when you're going to do this? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know yet. Um, you, you said you had the, the um, yeah, culvert in stock. Yeah, because data policy that with the culverts in, in the driveways. Yes. Yeah. So that culvert size is more than adequate right there? It's been 18-inch culvert. It'll go to 18. Yeah. Because he's going to, if putting that road in there, he's going to divert some more water into that ditch. So yeah. I'd like to see it go to an 18. Yep. So I mean, I, I could pick the culvert up next week if it's if it's yeah, available. I have it here. Okay. All right. I'll be in touch with you then. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Now he just makes a check out for the town of Berlin, right? Yes, please. <laughs> what does a culvert cost? Oh, uh, 18 inches, like 985 cross. So, right, if I was to go somewhere and buy it, it's going to be 15 14 dollars. This way, this way, it's what we want. Right, right, makes total sense. Sometimes I gotta talk to you about the road in front of that house. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> On that one there, I was thinking of just a crush culvert with more of the, give a little more dirt over the top of it. Yeah. It's too flat down through there, but I don't think as you do that, you gotta go to the metal because they don't make plastic on something. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Sean Lamson. <laughs> I had thought Sean was coming in. I tried to call him today, but his voicemail was full, so I couldn't <laughs> leave him a message. Um, you saw my memo on that. He spoke with me. We had a mistake in the in the um, bid spec. Um, but you had spoken with Sean, mm -hmm. and his I thought his bid did indicate that he understood about what we were looking for. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Excuse me. Had he done this for us before? He did. Yeah. He worked for us two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And so the bid was um, fifty-five hundred. Sean's bid five thousand. Mister um, Dexter's bid. Mister Dexter added on um, the additional would be additional his per hour rate. Sean included his second pass on the rows, and, and he knows what those rows were because mm -hmm. you went over that. Mm -hmm. Last year, um, as you remember, I looked up what we paid last year. It was fifty two fifty. Mm -hmm. was, what was the bid last year? Uh, 5000 It's the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I understand and I regret that the uh, request wasn't correct. It will be next year. Um, because they only make a five foot. Mm -hmm. Am I right on that? Five over foot. the rail mower. Over the rail mower is only the biggest is five foot. Uh, but I don't see really a valid reason to mm -hmm. change the. How, bit. how many hours would it take to do the second pass? Two. Two, two hours? It's only up here on the hill. Just yeah. a block though. And the intersection's up here because there's just so much traffic. So and yeah. it seemed like we took that into consideration and went with the low bid. He did quite a bit, like over on West Hill, um, East Road, different places that he felt it wasn't safe after more than just one pass, he made another pass, but he didn't. <coughs> Mm -hmm. The only hourly rate that he charged was up here on the hill, and it was two hours. Mm -hmm. That was Sean? No. 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 So my only concern with this was that <clears throat> if he did bid it at six foot, which would require two passes, then he was bidding it differently than now it was at the time. Um, you, see what, you know what I mean. But his, he bid. his bid said that he was one pass. One pass both sides, 46 feet. Is that what it says there? So it's well, he, that's what the bid proposal was. So, so my, the thing I was yeah, trying to, hold on. Okay. The thing I was trying to wrap my head around was, for me, just when I was looking at this, because um, I, I couldn't figure out what was missing, but we put it out to bid for six feet. We accepted bids based on six feet, and then we accepted a bid that was, so Lamson, knowing he was gonna have to mow six feet wide, put in his bid for 5,500. Then we ended up accepting a bid for five feet without asking, without even going back to get any additional information from the other people that bid. That was the only thing that I thought. It didn't, it wasn't, you know, if he, had, if he had had notification that it was a five foot swap, maybe it would have changed. Maybe it wouldn't have it changed his bid at all. But that was what my, you know, if he had a, I don't know, uh, uh, that's all. I, I just, I think that if he, I think that if we put this out at a six foot wide pass, then you can't just accept bids when they come in at five feet without at least giving the other people that bid an opportunity to bid on it or make sure that they have the same price. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? I understand really? what you're saying, but the one thing that I vaguely remember, and I'd have to either listen to the tape again, but I feel like we had a small discussion about one of the two bids the owner not having the particular mower, but maybe thinking about expanding. And I feel like he had one there was some ones. discussion that we, a few of us had about that. So I don't remember how it got started, but I feel like we talked about it when we were negotiating, when we were looking at who to um, get the bid. And I know we Just talked also about Berlin residents too. That was also part right. of our discussion. So I just, came up. The, the equipment, I mean, he was bidding it with an over-the-rail mower. I mean, regardless of whether somebody owns one now or not, that's what the bid is for, that's what they'll have to do. And the bid was also for six feet. So my, just, my thought on changing a bid or changing what we accept in the middle of the bid process was that somebody could put up a stink about it. That's all. Were you thinking rebidding it? I would think that we'd at least 
give the opportunity to bid it at five feet, you know, and be specific about it. I think that seems fair and reasonable, that's all. How much is the time to add? Hundred and fifty? Something like that, yeah. Well, <clears throat> Sean told me that he was renting a mower for one week. And I don't think he can do it in one week. So I don't know why he would have thought that he had to bid more because he had to make two passes around the whole town. I don't really know. That's uh, not I know. whether it's Sean because and what equipment he has is to me is irrelevant because I he came and talked with me and I told him it was one pass around town. That was it. And then uh, n nothing was mentioned about feet because I didn't know anything about this. And then he, he asked me, well, are you going to walk two passes in some areas? And I said, yes. And I said, the way we're doing that is, is by the hour. So. I certainly agree that it's not fair if you're not on equal footing when someone gives a bid. Well, I, I, I agree with you on that, I, absolutely. Um, and, and I certainly sympathize with Sean. I had a nice discussion with Sean. Uh, I was hoping he'd be here tonight so that he could talk to you about it. Yeah. Um, but when I read his bid, it says price for mowing road size will be 5,500. This is for one pass both sides. He doesn't say anything about two passes. Right. No, I know. And, and you know, so I mean, I, I, I understand. I agree with what you're saying. It's unfortunate, and I should make every effort not to have that happen again. Um, there's no, because there's it's, no it's, issue. it's unfortunately um, the select board, and we do have it in the bid, has the dis discretion to to grant what they feel is in the best interest of the town. So, in other words, if you had a bid that they decide you decided for whatever reason not to take the lowest bid, for example. Maybe the lowest bid was I'm, I'm not talking this situation, yeah, no, but, <laughs> but, um, but you know, maybe the lowest bid is, is a vendor that isn't going to be able to fulfill his obligation or something. I mean, the board, there'd be no problem with the board doing that. There's no state law. Um, it's a policy of the board to, to, bid, to bid things, which is a normal policy that towns have. Um, so that's, that's my only statement with it. Um, I understand it's regretful, it's too bad. Um, and I'm sorry that happened. Yeah, I um, think if I had given that, if, if I were at the other meeting, I would have brought that up and I would have just asked the table. And, you know, and we didn't think, think yeah, we didn't think of it then either. To, for I, clarification, yeah. like we did with the other lawn mowing. Right, right. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, so I agree with you. But I think at this point in time that it's not rebidding it really isn't gonna help us. Oh well, we don't have time. You know, yeah. Given that we're right in the season right, and we've right. made the decision. That's just my opinion. I'm not sure you can find <laughs> Anything further on this? Thank you for speaking with Sean when he came in. Oh, I, I like talking with people. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, highway truck replacement discussion. So, You're on. Um, Tim, one thing that, and, and I've said this to you, um, you know what our financial situation is. Um, can we? Is this absolutely, I mean, I, I saw his, this leasing obligation. We could go out and borrow money for a less rate than what he has. And I know he's trying to make a solution and I appreciate it. Um, but what I'm not understanding, and I'm not saying that it's not so, but what is wrong with the, other, with the truck? Could it go another year? And if you feel it couldn't, I mean, obviously, you got to have equipment that works. It's, we've been on a seven year program. Mm -hmm. It's going to be seven years. Right. And we're going to have to dump some money into it. What 
what's your what's the where's the money going to go to it? Is it uh, it's it's got to have a new hoist, which is thirty five hundred dollars. It's got to have new cylinders on both the front and the wing, back of the wing. Um, steering boxes leaking oil. Um, it's going to have to have um, rear brakes. It's going to have to have rear tires. Um, we just dumped about 5,000 into it with a new fan hub and a cooling issue. So, I mean, it's just, I, I feel it's going to start nickel and diming in big time. But those things that I mentioned that have got to be done before it goes into another winter. The hoist actually should be done before that. But. Are they still holding um, tight well, with the price they quoted us? Uh, he never got we, back to me. Um, they did get the state, the Vermont state bid. They yeah. did. And he told me that they would. Okay. I did. What was the total price again on that truck? Two hundred and five thousand six forty seven with a fifty thousand dollar trade in value. That's two hundred and five thousand with the trade in or two hundred and five thousand minus the trade in? One hundred and fifty five six forty four. can fix it or have it fixed but well the other thing we want to avoid is I know you've had trouble with the grader yeah and there are other equipment I mean obviously if you wait you're just deferring your problem I'm just trying I to know, get we were, we were talking greater this year because it's getting tired and we just went down for a week here Last week, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I just got it back. I ain't got a bill on it yet, but I hate to see it. Yeah. What's wrong with it? Water pump. Dump four and a half gallons of antifreeze into the crankcase. What was the warranty on this one? The new truck? Seven years. Yeah, they went longer, I remember yeah, that. Was it seven? I thought yeah. it was eight or something. Well, there's an extended warranty opportunity yeah. that you buy. And you I get one year's warranty yeah. from the factory, and then you buy extended warranty, which is included in that price. Mm -hmm. And it's seven years. So if we had to look at the next five years, you're imagining greater this truck and two other trucks, one other truck? No. Um, your next truck is a 15, so that's yeah. 22 if we go in the seven years. Okay, so we got, so, so it'd be just at the end of that then. Yeah. So, so this truck, greater, and another truck. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. I mean we talked greater last year. Mm -hmm. and then the whole deal with the FDA, we had to spend the money for that. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking, if we press the snooze button on this, what we don't want to do is we don't want to have a year where we're getting two. Right. Yeah. And that's, that yeah, would be exactly. bad. I concur. Because yeah. we've, been, we've been, this is, we got one, it's an 18, but we got it in 17. So we're, we're, um, you know, we've been two years without mm -hmm. purchasing. How much things were in that truck? Two hundred. So. Um, greater replacement cost. Yeah. Two hundred and fifty to two hundred and seventy-five thousand. Okay. So in the same ballpark, anyways. Yeah. And what's our greater worth? What's it worth? Um. He said around one hundred and fifty thousand. Oh wow. So. The trailer would, would be pretty favorable then. So we're looking at what, 100, 100 then net? Huh? Yeah, but, but <laughs> I mean, very even good. so. Yeah. But the trouble is, is you're talking, you're talking buying another cat and you're putting it out to bid, it's going to take, and John Deere may take you, win the bid on the price, but not give you the trade in. Mm. Well, John Deere's the one that gave me the price on the trade in. 
He said between the 130 to 150,000. Then you still have to take and put it up to bid for cat. Yeah. <laughs> That's where bids can be tricky. Yeah. Well, well, so, I mean, that's stuff that has to be done. Cat and John Deere are the only two now. Volvo will make it greater than one. But, but, it ha but it has to be done at, at some point. Yeah. So when we pull the trigger on each of these things, it's, it would be good not to do two at the same time. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you, you don't feel like it would be better to look at a greater option before the truck? Or what do you think is going to be the most cost? I mean, we've, we've put some money into the greater. I mean, we just had a whole bunch of motor work done on it last year. And then the water pump. I mean, it's you know it's things break. The truck gets worked a lot harder. Than <coughs> well, and when I I mean, if you think about it, if you have a seven-year warranty on the truck, it's a little over twenty-two thousand dollars a year to have a truck that's completely covered under warranty. But being new on the board, my issue is I don't know where the heck we pay for that when you're saying we, we used up a lot of the funds that we had available. Kind of set aside, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, we were the board was trying to um, set aside a certain amount of money for an equipment fund in order to avoid having to borrow the money um, for this equipment. Um, obviously, we've had some other crises happen, and so we don't have any money that's set aside. We've got two hundred thousand that we budgeted this year in. in well, when I say this year, I mean the FY twenty budget, which begins in three weeks. Um, and we have the culvert on Richardson Road, which I wish I knew exactly how much it was going to cost. Mirror Lake costs us two hundred eight thousand. Um, we did have a grant on that one. We do not on Richardson as of yet. Um, we don't think we're going to get one. I, you know, I it's question whether we would because we got it last year. However, well, the only can thing, we wait the only another year I for know. Richardson Road? I mean, it's the same, we're in the same situation. Uh, the only thing I know about the grant situation is, is that the state's a little behind because of all the flood damage that we've gotten. In. Right. In the last few years. They were very generous last year, and I appreciate that. So, so I think socking the money away so that we don't have to get the loan is still probably the right thing to do, and to continue doing that going down, going down the road. But I think in this case, I think getting the loan or getting the lease, whatever, whatever the financial instrument that we use is, and get the truck and solve this now, I think it's still the right thing to do, even if we do have to eat some of the interest. We could borrow the money, rather than do this lease deal, mm -hmm. we could borrow the money on our own at a more attractive right. interest rate. Can you Diane point out what the interest rate would be? Um, we usually bid those, and I, you know, some of the last one was like 0.9 or something. Well, see, Very the thing, small. The amount. thing is with the lease was there's, because you weren't here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you was trying to financial work it through. It, yeah. it was, you lease it. And the first year is no payments. And then at the end of the year, if you have the money then, you can just pay off the truck. So This in a way works similar because I always arrange it so the first payment is a year after we get it because only, we only pay once a year. So it's yeah. it's nice to get a loan and say I'll pay you next year for my first payment. But <laughs> well, and, and, and so I mean we could pay off the whole thing, but with whatever sort of loan or lease that we get done, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And if the mirror, if the Richardson Road project doesn't cost, there may be some extra left over. Who knows? That. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. And then what if there <laughs> happened that miraculously be grant money that came in? You can't use that in the budget towards the truck, right? No. Not towards the truck. No, it's got to go towards yeah. whatever you're granting. Mm -hmm. But we could use that yeah. to pay for Richardson Road and have money left over then in the highway fund mm -hmm. to it's then lovely. pay for the truck. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, it wouldn't be post-repair that we would receive the grant? Yeah. No, no, you'd have, you'd have to do it before. You, when you get a grant from the state, you have one year to use it. Right. So and how bad, when is that? Like, how bad is that Richardson Road covert? It's pretty bad. Pretty it's terrible, bad. So, right? Yeah. No. There, there, there's multiple trucks. There's only one Richardson Road. So, I mean, well, if, if, that, if that fails, that's it. It's no, one of these no, issues I that. I didn't know how bad it really was. I was curious. It's gone too long. 
um, and it should be fixed. And we have another big culvert coming up, but I'm not telling you about it right now. I know. Um, <laughs> however, again, we're in the same situation. I mean, if we postpone. Um, yeah. We pressed the snooze button once yeah. already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. If we if we do take and do the lease arrangement for one year, there's going to be an interest payment there somewhere. Yes, three point seven two percent on the full amount. On on the full amount of a uh, hundred. He's given us five. A, let me just pass this to you so you refreshes your memory. Well, we just you said you can put it out to bed for traditional. Oh, I believe that we could get our own loan. Much at a much more well, and, and then bank. we can do it side by side with this so and see. with whatever bank loan we might see. Mm -hmm. And we are, um, of course, satisfying a loan this year. So I mean, mm -hmm. it's usually when you have a car, you finish paying for it, both and then it's time to get another both one. Both people <laughs> are new here. The board made a um, thing so that if we buy under state contract, you're not going to get it cheaper if you put it out to bid. Nobody's going to beat the state. Right, I'm trying to bid for financing. Yeah, and yeah. I, that's why that's why we're going with international. And there's no bid because they have the state contract. Mm, I understand that. Yeah. It's way cheaper. We like to put the bid for financing out um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it it, it the bank sometimes are hungry. Mm -hmm. um, so in three weeks. The new budget comes in, and in, in how much is in the equipment fund then? 200,000, 205,000, something like that. Now, I don't, to be honest with you, is what we're hearing on the call, I don't think it's going to get done this year anyways. Well, I mean, we've got to reserve the money. Yeah, I know you that, know. but I'm um, just saying, though. So if, if, you, if you ordered a truck, when would the truck come? If, if you decide to buy it now, it'll be in August. So it would be set up and ready to go for the winter. So you got a $10,000 interest payment roughly. But if you were to take and borrow the money over, what, five years? Usually we do five years, yeah. So you've got a hundred and if it's 1%, 155,000, that's 15, 30 divided by five. Fingers went to work in a hurry. <laughs> um, I just want a straight line interest. Uh, yeah. So you're looking at, um, you know, somewhere, what, around 30 some odd thousand? You're looking around 30 something thousand. A year, so if you do the full amount. Now, there's, I mean, well, that's 155,000. So that's the trade-in amount. That's the, 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 the truck plus less the trade-in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the net. Yeah. Um, and now, if you put, again, we're buying this truck in August. I don't know if we'll know about Richardson Road, but maybe we could throw a little bit well, of money toward it. The thing I was thinking it. of is, is that with the 200,000 in the new budget. You stop and think thirty thousand. So now you have a hundred and seventy thousand left in your equipment fund that you can rob for the Richmond Road project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, but the sure. cost you and when we do the financing the budget, cost. we budget in the debt service, so it goes to another spot. Yeah. And we wouldn't be budgeting that until this fall when we do the twenty-one budget. Is everyone clean? Yeah. <laughs> or, so, yeah, so I, 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 think, I, I think if we put the, put the financing out to bid, come back next time, and then we can mm -hmm. at least look at it in a yeah. little bit more concrete so, area. So would you like us to put the RFP out for the financing? I think so. I mean, it's not going to hurt anything. Absolutely. OK. Sure. What, $150 for the uh, no? Um, usually with the banks, we just mail them yeah. um, or email them. They, we have we have all our connections. Yeah. So he told you that they would hold that price. 
I really would like to check with him again, but he told me they had the state bid, and I asked about the price, and I don't know whether he meant they were holding it until this meeting. Yeah, this yeah. meeting. Um, so that's. They probably want to tell him that we're. It could be. So I will call probably him tomorrow. interested in moving forward. I will call him tomorrow and tell him where we are, and um, and I think we have a good relationship with Clarks, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping that they would work with us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. At least now we have a plan of attack on it. So, let me write myself a note. Anything else, Tim? Thank you, Tim. Okay. Uh, Just getting a lot of complaints about road grading. I don't know if Stop you guys, it. I don't know if you guys have known, but we were down a week. So we got down a bit. You know, if you had a new grader, you could. No. I'm not, I'm not, I don't. I have a problem with the grade. Yeah. Well, I couldn't help I mean, it. We got behind. Just the I noticed the rain every other day. Right. So the weather's notice. been a huge. <laughs> well, we got a lot of complaints from hey. down here away. It's the only time people actually did the speed limit more. Yes. Or less. <laughs> <laughs> and out of all the ones I got, one person called me back and thanked us for doing it That's the other nice. day. Nice. You know, it's funny, even with the rain we got, that road still held up. Yeah. Well, part of the problem, part of that deal is, is that we've gone to the, the granite yeah. instead of that. Well, I mean, you, that black it had like a day and a half, two days of, of, of being dry and people driving over it. It, it hardened it right up. So yeah. It held up well. I mean, I, I just, I don't know how many complaints you guys all got, but I I've had quite any. a few. That's because you're doing your job, too. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I know how they feel. It's, yeah. it's bad. And it's hard on the cars. And I was, if this had gone worse scenario, if it had been a crackhead or, yeah. or a head gasket or something, they were talking three to four weeks yeah. getting it fixed. So I got prices on rent and graders because I know what it was, you know, what it was going to happen. Yeah, and uh, I'm working tomorrow, yeah. trying to well, get caught up. Well, as long as we didn't do any damage to the bearings. No, no, he said it. Well, we didn't run it. Yeah. Heat it up and just. Well, well it, it sh the computer shut him down over on. Yeah. Uh, he was coming back out across down the road with it, and it shut him down. He was able to get back here, but it puts you in limp mode. Yeah. And we put the antifreeze into it because it was down on the antifreeze. And the oil wasn't wasn't milky and it wasn't hot. Yeah, but didn't take it all good. No. So, but you no. Know, the mechanic said that we changed. He changed the oil the day he changed the water pump. We changed it the next day, and then changed it again. We ran in a day and changed yeah. it again and put a new filter on it. He said we should be safe. He said it's and I. I'd run it. Check. I'd run it. And then uh, when you get ready to do your last, do your next oil change, see if you, they can draw a sample, make sure there's no high metal content. Yeah. But I mean, I checked the oil today. Uh, it's clean. It's, yeah, it's clean as a whistle. So. Okay, man. Moving right along. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, license approval policy. As you recall, um, Keith Paxton from Cornerstone had come in and spoken to you about the possibility of the board allowing a catering permit to be approved by the town clerk, um, which is kind of how it's set up. Everywhere else. It, every, mm -hmm. Everywhere else. Um, and I guess, you know, the clerk, I think we have a reliable person that knows yeah. who, who knows things. Yep. and would be able to make that decision. It would save some people, it would be, make it a little more user friendly for people that don't have time to wait till another select board meeting. And shorten our meetings? And I sincerely doubt that, but <laughs> <laughs> however, if that's a selling point, yeah, boy, your meetings would really be short. Um, well, 
Anybody want to make a uh, motion on this? Or? But do we have a policy that we're right. adopting, or are we directing Dana to draft one? I was thinking you would direct me to draft one. Okay, I move that Dana drafts a catering license approval policy. My second motion. Is this for, for the town clerk to do? Yeah. Okay. But if he brings us something else, we'll yeah. tell him no. <laughs> well, you never know. No. <laughs> Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, committee people? Yes, thank you. Um, all I need to know is where to put that one. Let's do this one. I, first of all, um, I've just got a little housekeeping to do. Um, the liaisons to the fire company, those are annual appointments, and I never remember to do it. So if you would, I'm assuming that Mr. Hansen and Mr. Diamantides are still willing to serve another year, and I would encourage the board to reappoint them to that. Uh, so I move to appoint myself and Jerry Diamantides to be the town liaisons to the Berlin Volunteer Fire Department. And I second that motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Then um, the Planning Commission has had a few resignations and they're having a real problem with a quorum. We have two candidates <coughs> that have come forward and are interested in being appointed. As you know, I usually ask them to come in to meet you first. Um, one of the candidates is Jared Felch, who lives on Stewart Road, is a lifelong resident, and I imagine most of us know him. Mm -hmm. um, he would like to be appointed. The other is a new resident, Jacob Cokewell, lives on Partridge Farm Road. Um, he expressed interest and he has been to a couple planning board planning commission meetings and the members of the planning commission have also encouraged me to encourage you to have him appointed um, if we do not appoint tonight we would not have a quorum at their next meeting um, we've had Two have actually resigned, and Gary LaRoche, I think I just got, he's resigned as well. I just got his resignation for personal reasons. So I move that we appoint Jared Felch and Jacob Cokewell, Cokewell. to the Planning Commission. And I second that motion. Any further mm -hmm. discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And finally, um, Mr. Long, who was ap appointed as an alternate member of the Public Works Board, um, there has been a resignation on the Public Works Board, and we would like to encourage you to appoint Mr. Long as a regular member. What's his first name? Edward Long. Move to appoint uh, Edward Long to the um, Public Works Commission. I second that motion. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, any other committee? No. That's all I have. Thank you. That was, yeah, that was finished. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Google select board minutes. I make the motion that unless there's any discussion, any discussion, I make the motion that we approve the select board minutes for May 2nd and May 16th, 2019. I'll second that. I can't, vote. I can't vote on the 16th, but. Uh, So we probably do these separately. Maybe split them. Yeah. Split them? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll make the motion to approve the select board minutes of May 2nd, 2019. Second. And I make the motion that we accept the select board minutes of May 16th, yeah. 2019. You, you need to finish yeah. the first one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Sorry. True. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Any further discussion on the select board minutes for May 2nd? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. I make the motion of approval for the select board minutes of May 16, 2019. Second the motion. There was a just a typo uh, at the top of page two of four in the down street section. It was just um, on the fourth line down, the sentence that begins downtown is anxious to have a presence in Berlin. That should just read down street. Oh, okay. I will fix it. So I make the motion that we approve the select board minutes of May 16, 2019 with the correction noted. Second the motion. Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, administrator I've been waiting to show you. Um, I've spoken to you about the all boards night. This is going out tomorrow. Um, inviting people to the all boards night. It's going to be Wednesday the 26th over at the Grange. And somehow I'm going to figure out how to get a light dinner. Need a catering license? So, at <laughs> <laughs> so um, what time? I'm sorry. It's going to begin at 5 30. Um, I'm wondering how many people will come, but you know, 30 maybe, I'm hoping. Um, and basically, it will be a time. Well, I think it's nice for all the communities to get together and see each other and, and uh, mingle and that type of thing. Also, um, We'd like to make a presentation on the town center so that all the committees know what we're, what we're, what the goal is. Is the fire department being invited to this as well? I could certainly invite them. Yeah. Um, Jeremy and and uh, Joe, is that what Th you those would be the, the best people, and then they can they can invite the fire department board. Okay. All right. So I'm hoping that you all can come. Um, the next meeting, Ann Donahue is coming to talk to you about Act 46. Okay. Uh, the Black Road discussion will be on the agenda next next week. Uh, I mean, in two weeks. Um, Josh wasn't in town, and Beth wasn't in town. And again, Josh asked you the other week yep. to take over the winter maintenance and to allow to drop the restriction on the width. And I have a couple of these. Flo, would you like yes, to I would like one. Thank have you so one? Much. Wonderful. Any other takers? Okay. I try. It's a lawyer, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is. Um, I get a weekly construction update for the interest the exit six project. They're still grubbing the top of the the uh, ledge. ledge and uh, getting ready, they're going to be closing exit six the 18th of June, and it'll be closed at the end of July, except that they'll be reopening on the 4th of July. And that's all I have. What do you think, Adina? Convene the liquor board? Move to recess the select board and convene the liquor control board. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. This, oh, okay. this is a, uh, an outside consumption permit. It's for an extension for the, um, it's a temporary extension for the bowling alley, um, Twin City Lanes, uh, for an, a, a function that they're having. They already have an outside permit, but they want to extend the area. Okay. Uh, for a little bigger party. Move to approve the outside consumption permit for Twin City Lanes. A second the motion. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 And motion to exit the liquor control board. I need a motion to exit the liquor control board. 
second. And convene the select board meeting. And convene the select board, absolutely. 100%. Seconding that. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's good round, uh, round table, Justin? It's good to be back, but I lost in limbo there for a second. <laughs> No, I don't have anything. I don't have anything either. Sure. And executive session, Dana? Um, no. Who to adjourn? Chicken. <laughs> okay. uh, all those in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye.